Well, I'd like to begin by welcoming all of you to the first uh, event in our McCurcher Lecture Series for Term 2. My name is Michaela Keaton. I'm a professor here at the law faculty as well as um, a co-chair of the speakers program. And uh, so it's my pleasure to say a few words of welcome before turning it over to um, our vibrant panel. <laughs> As we gather here today, we acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis, and we pay our respect to uh, the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. I also want to begin with an, an acknowledgement of the um, sponsors of the lecture series. Uh, the McCurcher Law Firm has been sponsoring the lecture series for the last five years and, and uh, I want to acknowledge the impact that that contribution has in allowing us to bring in a wide range of speakers um, and open those up to the public as well as the law school community. Today's event as well is put on in partnership with the Center for uh, Forensic Behavioral Science and Justice Studies here at the University of Saskatchewan. And following the panel today, the center is going to have some research posters displayed outside of this room. And we encourage you as you're leaving to take some time to uh, have a glance at those and read about the research that's going on in, um, in that companion center. So with those uh, acknowledgements at the outset, I'm just going to take a moment to introduce um, briefly our panel. I'm going to keep the introductions fairly um, fairly informal so that we can get into the dialogue that we really want to, to uh, have with the panelists and with you today about the important topic of um, developments in problem-solving courts and in particular the mental health strategy and initiative here in, um, in our provincial court. So I want to begin with um, Judge Marilyn Penner. Um, Judge Penner is, uh, and we're proud to claim her as an alumni of this college, and, uh, and I want to mention that, um, that Judge Penner had many years of practice in, in Saskatoon in private practice and various positions in leadership around the law profession before her appointment to the provincial court a couple of years ago. And since then, she's taken on the very a very important re leadership role as judge in the mental health strategy, and that's something that uh, she'll speak to. Um, Beside Judge Penner is uh, our own Professor Glenn Luther, who many of you will uh, know. Um, Glenn joined the faculty almost 20 years ago now, and uh, we view him as our, our expert um, in, um, with a foot both in private practice in that he's a, a very experienced criminal lawyer as well as an accomplished academic and uh, has done a lot of work in the and the cross-border area between criminal practice and uh, psychiatry and teaches the law and psychiatry course along with Dr. Mila, whom I'm about to introduce. And so um, uh, you'll learn more about uh, you know, Glenn's perspective and background as we move through this conversation. Finally, I want to introduce Dr. Mansfield, Dr. Mansfield Mila. Uh, who is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the U of S. Um, he's an academic forensic psychiatrist and a founder of the forensic subspecialty in Canada. He is also um, a very experienced practically in that he's called to testify regularly on many aspects of the interface between law and psychiatry. And his research focuses on the psycholegal aspects of forensic mental health with a, a focus and expertise in the area of FA, uh, or the issue of FASD. So with that brief introduction, I'm going to turn it over to the moderator of today's panel, who is uh, Professor Heather Haven. Uh, uh, Heather is an Associate Dean of Research, our Associate Dean of Research here at the at the law school, and she's also on the executive committee of the Forensic Center. And uh, so I'll pass it over to Heather now to begin the conversation with, uh, with our panel. All 
Right. Thank you, Michaela, for those uh, introductions. And I think um, um, the format for today is um, I'm going to, as I said, moderate. I have some questions that hopefully they're not too hard uh, that I'm going to ask uh, the panelists. And, and we'll allow, you know, those types of, of I guess, uh, interaction back and forth for about the next 45 minutes. And then I want to open up the floor to questions uh, from the audience, um, hopefully then wrapping up with questions for about the last 15 minutes and then wrapping up by, by 1 o'clock. Okay. So um, I think I'll start with Professor Luther. Um, Glenn, um, maybe if you could, can you tell us a little bit about how the mental health strategy got started here in Saskatoon? Sure, Heather. <clears throat> so in Saskatoon, we call it the Mental Health Strategy Court, or the MHS Court. Um, it started first in November of 18th, I think, 2013 was the date that we started the court. Uh, it may be useful to know that there was a discussion, discussions going on for about um, 10 years before that amongst various of us in terms of how, what we should do and how we should introduce this. So Dr. Mila was involved, myself. Uh, uh, lawyers, senior lawyers from Legal Aid and from the Crown, very committed to thinking about these topics and led by a judge, now retired Judge Sheila Whalen, who has really driven to get a court going. Uh, so we, as I say, we started in November of 2013. Uh, interestingly, you might know that we set it up without any funding or any support anywhere. It was simply, let's do it and see what happens. Um, and so now it's six years later, and I guess I'll say I think that's still true. I mean, there's certainly some commitment from the um, uh, health region and social services, but no direct commitment from government to support the court. And we'll, we can talk more about that later. So, Glenn, I understand that um, the mental health, strat or mental health courts um, are part or fit in within the realm of what we might call therapeutic, um, therapeutic courts or therapeutic jurisprudence. Can you tell us a little bit about that theory of law of, therape of therapeutic jurisprudence? Yeah, so as law students will know, there's various theories of how law works and how law should work. And, and this particular um, theory of therapeutic jurisprudence, interestingly, rose out of Florida of all places in the United States, and, and they were the first uh, jurisdiction in the world to start a mental health court. Uh, ger therapeutic jurisprudence asks the question, is the law helping people? And if it's not, why not? And so essentially, therapeutic jurisprudence encourages lawyers to think about helping people. And so as you think about a, a mental health court process, I want you to see that that's essentially what the court is designed to do, is try to help the people that come before the court to leave a, lead a good life. I was tempted to say better life, but I think I would say a good life, um, and to look into the issues that they are facing and what brings them before the court and to see if uh, the court can assist them in uh, doing something about that problem. Notice it might be a mental health condition, uh, most obviously, in a mental health court, it might also be a uh, cognitive impairment, which l often, like FASD, for example, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, or, or other cognitive impairment. Um, of course, the reality is that most people come before a court, uh, in, in this kind of court, with multiple issues that they're facing. Someone might have FASD and, a me and another mental disorder. Uh, they might have an addiction. Uh, so notice addictions at the moment are not directly involved in the mental health strategy, uh, but certainly many of the uh, uh, people that come before the court will have an addiction. That's simply not why they are there uh, in the initial point. We can talk more about that in a minute. Okay, so, so just so that I, under, I, I love that, that we needed a theory of law that says, is the law actually helping people? <laughs> but um, um, but it's, it's wonderful that, that that's where the roots are. So you've, all, you've mentioned um, different kind of complex issues that people have that are facing courts. And I understand that there's multiple different kinds of, I'll say, therapeutic courts that are out there. Um, and from my list, um, I know there's mental health courts, domestic violence courts, um, uh, community and wellness courts, or wellness courts, community courts, and drug courts. Can you um, just explain some of the differences between those types of courts or the approaches those courts take? Yeah, so obviously I'll try to do this quickly, but I've already spoken about the mental health courts. And notice, um, all of these courts are what you might see as grassroots 
movement. So each one of the courts will arise in different centers. So for example, most of you may know that there's a drug court in Regina and there's a mental health court in Saskatoon. There is in fact a mental health court now as well in Regina, but initially it was the drug court started in Regina, mental health court sa started in Saskatoon. And I think the only reason I can say that is because that's what the people that set it up wanted at the time. So uh, for us in Saskatoon, it was breakfast meetings with the people I mentioned before for a number of years discussing what we should do. Uh, we were focused a lot on people with FASD, that is Mansfield and myself, and uh, urging that, and others were talking about more functional disorders like schizophrenia and so on. And so that's why we ended up with a mental health court in Saskatoon. Um, but there are, as Heather says, other programs in Saskatchewan, domestic violent courts are, are probably the most widespread in almost every center focusing on the issue. Notice there it's not necessarily a mental illness or an addiction, it's the actual offense is a concern. So domestic violent courts try to focus on that topic and try to decide uh, how to deal with that. Drug courts obviously dealing with addictions. Um, uh, wellness courts are interesting because that is, is actually a, a combination drug or mental health court and drug court. So the word wellness is the most obvious example in Canada comes out of um, the Yukon Wellness Court which uh, some years ago changed their mental health court into a wellness court when, with the direct intention of trying to deal with people with addictions as well. So it is essentially a drug court and a mental health court. Um, we also have community courts, the most obvious one in Canada being in Vancouver. The Vancouver Community Court was designed to deal with crimes that committed in a certain geographical area. And certainly in Saskatoon, I've often thought that might be a model that we think about. If you're interested particularly in that kind of model, sort of like a wellness model as well, uh, I would encourage people to look up the Red Hook Community Justice Center, which is in Brooklyn and New York and is one of the models that a lot of us have admired and thought that that might be useful. So all of those courts that I've mentioned are examples of so-called therapeutic or problem-solving courts uh, uh, th that are, you know, trying to do different things and assist those accused that come before the court. Well, well Glenn, I know in October of this year, um, I know you were in Nunavut, <laughs> but the, um, um, John Morgan had announced that they intended to introduce a drug court in Saskatoon. Um, do you know much about that, or do you think that this is a, a good model to be, um, to be adopting here? Well, I know a little bit about it, and it seems, and it's a very positive thing that it comes from a committee headed up by our mayor, Charlie Clark, who did some work, and there's an article in October 11th on Global News uh, where uh, Mayor Clark was suggesting a drug court for Saskatoon on behalf of a committee that it apparently had been at meeting and discussing uh, probably the meth crisis. I'm not sure that was expressed, but that's my sense. The Houston police were involved in other uh, uh, organizations. Uh, when Minister Morgan was asked about that, it's reported on October 15th in Global News, he said, yes, we're looking at a drug court for Saskatoon and it'll come sooner than later, I think is the quote. I guess I would say that that took me by surprise because no one had consulted me, which not that they have to, but it also, I understand, <laughs> surprised, the, surprised the judges because they were not, didn't know that was coming. Um, I think it's a very positive thing. I mentioned grassroots movements before and I would see Mayor, Mayor Clark's uh, uh, statements as being very important and that we should take them, s that justice should be taking them seriously. On the other hand, current research suggests that perhaps the drug courts are not the proper model. Um, there's certainly considerable criticism of drug courts as being overly harsh. Uh, there's criticisms of them being a, an aspect of the war on drugs that is sort of being debunked these days and, and some thought that perhaps a, ment a wellness court would be a better model. Uh, certainly, and um, we'll talk about this in a minute, the studies that we've done of the mental health strategy through the uh, Center of Forensic Behavioral Sciences and Justice Studies have all suggested that we need government funding for the court to it be successful. Uh, particularly around uh, court services, sort of uh, a clerk or a coordinator that's in charge of the files and can assist the accused in getting to appointments and so on is something that we've consistently said is missing from our court. And the, uh, but again, we have, have not been able to get funding either for that position or other innovations that we would do otherwise if we had the money. And by the way, no one has also paid us or the University of Saskatchewan or the Centre for any of the research and evaluations we've been doing. That's all of us, a number of workers, uh, uh, both academics and, and students working hard on 
doing that kind of research, but again, doing it off of the side of our desk, to use Judge Whalen's comments years ago, that she was just running the court off the side of her desk without support. So I guess the straight answer from me is, is that I don't think I want a standalone drug court for Saskatoon. I think that would be potentially a waste of resources that we need to look at expanding and assisting the mental health strategy to deal with those with addictions. Um, I, I want to just change focus a little bit here um, and talk a little bit about, um, I'll, I'll say restorative justice. We often hear about restorative justice and we use that in the context of GLADU principles or, or Indigenous or GLADU courts. Um, and we have a long tradition, well I guess it's not that long, but a fairly long tradition of a Cree court in northern Saskatchewan. Um, how does do those types of initiatives, whether they're GLADU courts or the, the Cree Court in the North, how do those compare to the problem-solving courts or the therapeutic courts that you've been talking about? Well, I think they are different. Um, notice that, uh, as I've said, the, the problem-solving courts come out of an idea of therapeutic jurisprudence, which is very much accused focus. So it's looking at that person that's before the court and trying to assist them. Um, the idea of restorative justice, of course, is more about peace and harmony in communities and, and you know, in a very basic way for non-Indigenous people would be, you might label it as, you know, victor offender reconciliation or something narrow like that. Um, so restorative justice is much more looking at harmony and balance in communities and, and presumably, uh, on the other hand, restorative justice isn't necessarily totally equated with something you might think of as indigenous justice or for that matter Cree or uh, uh, you know Dakota justice. I mean each one of our First Nations and, and Métis people will have their own traditions and a lot of them are discovering those and so notice the Cree court I think is very deliberately named as to deal with Cree people and that of course has been run for some 20 years in, in Saskatchewan. At the other, on the other hand, I would suggest the two movements really share a lot of common char characteristics of trying to do justice differently. I mean, I guess the starting point for me is to say that our justice system is extremely harsh. You know, we incarcerate more people in Saskatchewan than any jurisdiction in the world other than uh, some jurisdictions in the United States. So we are much higher than the rest of Canada and we are very, cl we are certainly the highest in Canada. Somewhere around 200 per 100,000 people will be in jail. Uh, and of course our indigenous incarceration statistics are right out of control and we've long been the, the, the major offender when it comes to the over incarceration of indigenous people. Heather mentioned that I've been in Nunavut recently and I'll just comment, you know, notice in Nunavut uh, you have the Inuit and of course the Inuit will have their own justice issues and certainly major issues that I faced up there talking to our students and others in that territory about how they should reform their justice system. Um, I want to take you back to something that you've mentioned earlier. Um, you talked about the research that's coming out of the Forensic Center um, on the mental health uh, court and, and I know that there has been uh, an evaluation done um, through the center. Um, there was a, a report that was released in the spring of 2019. I know there's a uh, new report that is just, I think even being released today, <laughs> or very, uh, or not, okay, Ashmini saying no, very close. <laughs> We're getting closer. I know that there have been grad students that have been involved with this project um, and have been successfully defending their, their, uh, their work. Can you tell us a little bit about that research or, or maybe a little bit about um, what, what has been happening in terms of, of those projects? Yeah, I mean, it, I think that um, the Center of Forensic Behavioral Science and Justice Studies in many ways is, a, is a, uh, uh, the result of, of considerable interdisciplinary work led by our uh, former executive director, Steve Wormuth, who sadly passed away earlier this spring. And um, for me personally, I met Steve tw some 20 years ago while I was in Calgary. At that time, I also met my friend Arlen Kent Wilkinson's, who's in the third role, who's a nursing professor. Uh, Dr. Mela and myself have been working together for some 20 years. Steve was a forensic psychologist, uh, and certainly there's others. There's other forensic nurses, there's other forensic psychologists, and so on, that have been interested in these areas. And we sort of have come together. Now, Steve had a strong connection with the Corrections Canada, and and uh, uh, his position as, as the sort of corrections person in psychology 
uh, ended up as, as the executive director of the Forensic Center in about 2012. Since that time, uh, a large group of us that had been working together produced an initial report in somewhere around 2012, 2013, which is the fo first poster against the back wall on the right as you go out the room. So that's from 2012, and one of the recommendations we made at that time was a mental health court for Saskatoon after we did a considerable surveys. It was an environmental scan of Saskatchewan services uh, related to justice issues and, and basically mental health services in Saskatchewan, and it's a major report that we issued then. And then since that time, we, we a smaller team of us have been working on evaluation of the mental health strategy as it got started. So we've now issued two reports, including the one that you've mentioned this spring, Heather. Um, uh, we've had master students and others working very hard on various aspects of the work around that. So we have a master's just being completed this exact week on uh, uh, perceptions of the participants in the, in the mental health court by a, a student by the name of Carmen Dell, who will hopefully be releasing research around that topic very soon. And then the other report that, that's the other poster is, is sort of a summary of a report that we're still working on, which is a more sort of um, uh, trying to assess how offenders do in the mental health strategy by getting information from police and health region and justice uh, before they were in the court and then after in the court. So that, that report is coming, but it's a lot of work, and it'll probably come out in the spring is my understanding, but we've got some summary of, of their research. The one that came out this spring was is entitled and is available on the website is the, all of our reports through the center look like this with the green cover. Um, that one is prof professionals' perceptions of the Saskatoon health strategy. So that report is designed to, we surveyed people that are working in the court, the lawyers, the judges, the psychologists, the nurses, the, and so on, the collaborative team that works in the mental health court of their perceptions of how it's working. and. Um, not surprisingly, it, it, it found, I think, that the professionals are very keen about the court, that they're very happy with the court, that they find it a very productive way to do their, to do their service to their community as a lawyer or as a, a, as a nurse or whatever. Uh, but at the same time, it shows some of the shortcomings of the court, uh, particularly around the lack of support that I mentioned earlier. Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to, to, to move down the table and... Um, and uh, Judge Penner, <laughs> I'd like to turn to you if, if I might. Um, I, um, maybe you could explain um, how you became involved with the uh, mental health court um, and, and this strategy being pursued at the provincial court and a, a little bit about your background and why you became interested in being involved with the court. I'm going to start out and uh, acknowledge readily that I am the rookie on this panel. Um, beside me are two... Um, two individuals who know the history of mental health strategy uh, much greater than I uh, ever will know it um, because of their direct involvement. Um, my involvement started uh, not long after I was appointed and I was appointed in 2017. I didn't know a lot about mental health strategy court at that point in time. I, I knew uh, provincial court had a specialized court called mental health strategy but I really hadn't had any involvement prior to my appointment. Um, I did like the idea of problem solving or therapeutic courts. Um, I've got an undergraduate degree in psychology, so I've always had an interest in the workings of the mind, the human condition. Those are things that um, have stayed with me since my undergraduate days, and I think they're uh, things that were frequently top of mind in my practice. I was a family law lawyer primarily before my appointment to the bench. And during that time, as a family lawyer, I was um, very much involved in alternative dispute mechanisms for individuals involved in family law disputes, whether that was mediation or collaborative family law. Um, I was always looking for a way to help people or see people help themselves um, in a positive way moving forward. And for that reason, mental health strategy had a bit of an attraction for me because it aligned somewhat with um, where I came from in private practice. Um, but as far as getting involved in the court, it was really a matter of um, uh, perhaps uh, good timing. Um, I had mentioned to our administrative judge that I was uh, curious to watch the workings of mental health strategy court and asked if I could sit in. 
Um, and he responded with, well, why don't you take it over? <laughs> <laughs> Which was um, a little bit uh, shocking, um, but after I had uh, a few opportunities to sit in on mental health strategy, um, learn a little bit more about the workings of the court, I was prepared to take him up on that offer. And uh, since mid-2018, I've been the judge primarily responsible for mental health strategy court in Saskatoon. Um, um, maybe it, it would probably be helpful um, for, for people in the audience. Can you tell us a little bit about how that mental health strategy court works? Um, how, how do people get to that court as compared to other courts? Uh, you know, how, what is the, the process that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of followed? So there's a really, um, I'm going to say it's an informal screening process at this point in time for participants in mental health strategy. Um, when the court was established, I think most of the referrals to the court came by way of the judge. Uh, but frankly, the judge doesn't have a lot of exposure to the individuals prior to um, their involvement or the referral into mental health strategy. And so now the referral is being made by the Crown prosecutors. Um, I don't know that there is a set criteria. Some of my observations uh, with respect to who's coming into mental health strategy court, um, they're individuals who are not in custody. Um, they're not charged typically with serious violence offense, so we're not dealing with people who are charged with murder or manslaughter. Uh, they're not individuals who are subject to dangerous or long-term uh, offender applications. Uh, my understanding is that the Crown is looking at the nature of the offense, public safety concerns, and whether there's a potential for benefit for an individual. Um, would they benefit from additional support and supervision uh, within the community? I think the Crown's also looking for whether there might be collateral issues at play for an individual's offending behavior. Are we looking at homelessness or poverty issues? Uh, things that um, there may be some means to assist the individual if they were to have some improved or some actual connections in the community to help them deal with the issues uh, that they're facing. Um, we don't exclude um, any conditions. I think uh, some of the jurisprudence talks about um, who mental health courts might be most suited for, but really uh, anybody who um, is demonstrating uh, some behavior that uh, might be representative of a mental health condition or concern um, could be referred into our court. We're not limited to functional disorders or a specific diagnosis, so you don't have to be schizophrenic or bipolar. Those are the people, some of the people that come in, but we also have people with personality disorders, anxiety disorders, uh, depression. Um, we've got individuals with cognitive impairments, FASD, um, and it may be FASD suspected and not necessarily diagnosed. Uh, and we do see a lot of individuals with addictions because frankly there are just a lot of concurrent uh, disorders where individuals are suffering from a mental health condition in addition to having an addiction. So that's, you know, a, a, um, we're very, I guess, uh, broad-based and open to who might uh, benefit from the assistance that is available um, in mental health strategy court. And so the Crown makes that referral. The individual would normally be in our out-of-custody docket court, our courtroom number four. They get referred to mental health strategy. Our court meets um, or sits uh, approximately twice a month. The um, it's on a Monday morning, so I've just come from mental health strategy this morning. Uh, we start with a pre-court meeting where we talk about the individuals who have been uh, referred to or who will have been involved in the court so that we have some understanding of what's been going on with them, what sort of happened uh, since their last court appearance or what might have got them referred into mental health strategy and start talking about uh, what services they could get connected and how we can make a plan for them going forward. And so we have the pre-court meeting and then we go into regular docket court. Um, and it is um, perhaps far from being regular docket court. It's a very different environment um, on mental health strategy days than I think it is on other days of the week. We've got um, the team uh, that's involved with the court. So we've got a dedicated Crown Prosecutor, uh, legal aid lawyers. Uh, there are some private um, 
counsel, private defense counsel who are involved. And then we have our community agencies. So we've got community corrections involved. Um, we've got the FASD network. Uh, they're a very um, active participant in our court. We have mental health and addiction services. And we see different support agencies come with individuals as well. Um, but all those members of the team are present along with the accused individuals and the accused perhaps um, individual support people. And we try to make court a little less formal. Um, I refer to individuals by their first names, try to make them feel comfortable, uh, try to recall personal details so that they come before me as an individual that I know uh, rather than just a, an accused person who nobody really has a lot of information on. So um, it's, a, I think, a little uh, less structured, a little more comfortable than regular docket court. And, and just so that I'm clear, um, it, when the referrals come, you have your pre-court meeting, are people prior to then coming to the docket, are they are you anticipating guilty pleas or not guilty pleas or, you know, are you delaying, delaying pleas or are you just going ahead with a guilty plea but then looking at what sentencing options are available? Right. So we are a delayed sentencing court and so what we do expect for participation, um, there are, there's a series of uh, forms uh, that individuals have to sign and review with their lawyer before participating in the court. Um, and ultimately on probably the first, second or third appearance, they're entering a guilty plea, but we're delaying sentencing. And we delay sentencing based upon um, what steps they might take to help address their mental health condition and what supports we might be able to help direct them to. And typically sentencing might be delayed six months to 12 months from the time that they first um, incur their charges or they first become involved in mental health strategy so that there's a period of time where they can access some of the resources that are available to them and hopefully uh, we can see some um, <coughs> stabilization or some improvement in their well-being. And I, and I know you said you've, you've um, had uh, responsibilities for this since 2018. So um, you have quite a uh, couple of years now of experience of, of, of being the administrative judge for this court. So um, do you think it's working? Uh, what, what, um, uh, what are just some of your observations or takeaways that you can, from a you know, professional perspective, maybe uh, share with us in terms of either successes or, or not successes, yeah. rooms for improvement? Well, I have to say we definitely have um, successes uh, with individuals, but we also have challenges with certain individuals that come before the court. By no means are we a solution to people's mental health uh, conditions, and that's not what we're aiming to do. I think ultimately, if we can see some improvement in an individual's well-being, um, I think for me that's um, probably um, the most satisfying thing that we can do is see what seeing someone come in and the difficult situation that they may be in. Uh, they don't have a doctor, they don't have a psychiatrist, uh, they haven't regularly been taking medication, they perhaps don't even have a diagnosis. And if you can then see someone move through the process so that they can um, ultimately have appropriate health care, be connected to supports within the community. So you're seeing individuals who uh, might be coming in really, really quite challenged by their mental health condition um, and who at the time of sentencing um, have now obtained some stability within their housing, they've got a psychiatrist, they're regularly taking their medication and hopefully they're not offending um, anymore or we've, um, I, I don't think that we can speak um, I don't think that we, I can say recidivism um, is decreased. I think the research on that is a bit um, all over the map. Some, some individuals, it will decrease their offending behavior. Others, it won't. But I think what, what I see as a success is if somebody has a better quality of life um, as a result of being connected to the court and the resources that are available. Um, the successes, the individual successes uh, that strike me, I know we had an individual who couldn't get to his doctor's appointment because he had such anxiety, he 
couldn't uh, he get there, but then he um, forget the address or the specific address, couldn't get into the actual building, and he walked around the block, and he just couldn't bring himself to call anybody. And we had, I think, three different appointments set up for him, and each time there was something that occurred um, that prevented him, um, because of his mental health condition, to actually get to that appointment. When he finally got there and got the assessment, we had a bit of a better understanding of what was going on uh, with his mental health condition and started on a path of treatment. The change in him was remarkable from somebody who was so anxious he was on the verge of tears when he appeared in court to someone who displayed a much higher level of confidence when he came in and was able to speak to his matters. So we see things like that that, um, you know, you can see that there's a difference is being made when individuals are connected to the resources that are available. I think I'll, I'll maybe go down the, the uh, road to, uh, to Dr. Mela. Um, Mansfield, you're a practicing psychiatrist, um, and um, I understand that one of the challenges, or maybe a significant challenge, to operating the mental health strategy court relates to the availability of psychiatrists to provide um, assessment or management of patients before the courts. Um, can you tell me a little bit, like, why is this? Why is there a, a difficulty with getting psychiatrists or these assessments? And is there what could be done or what is being done to try and improve that situation? Okay, I think um, just as uh, the judge said, she is the rookie on the table in terms of the mental health court. Maybe I'll say I'm the rookie in law because I'm not a lawyer. We're talking about mental health courts, so I focus a lot of my questions on psychiatry and mental health. One of the uh, things to think about in terms of why uh, psychiatry's availability and work, part of the challenges that we still have, has to do with what is the role of the psychiatrist in a mental health court. Uh, what the psychiatrist is called to do includes an assessment which means gathering a lot of information about the participants, trying to arrive at a diagnosis, and making recommendations to the court of what would be helpful in terms of the appropriate treatment plan. For that to occur, the psychiatrist has to work in a mental health system. And if the mental health system is not very, very supportive of the mental health court, that has an effect on the role of the psychiatrist. And we see that because on your regular office duty as a psychiatrist, you relate and collaborate with a lot of other professionals like social workers, psychologists, um, other professionals that will make the treatment plan to be implemented. So I think one of the challenges that we've been having is that I don't believe that there has been a priority placed on what we call forensic patients. So what that means is that in all those who come to see us for an assessment in the mental health field, they're divided into different subspecialties. Child, is anybody before the age of 18, then geriatrics are those above the age of 65. And you see a lot of services coming up in Saskatchewan that focus a lot on helping these individuals. A prime example is the Market Mall project. I don't know if many of you know about it, but this is a major investment where you have a one-stop shop for all those who have mental health issues that are above the age of 65. Unfortunately, we don't have that in Saskatchewan. And what that does is to inhibit the enthusiasm of a lot of the psychiatrists in taking on that job because a mental health court is only successful if you have community services. So a number of the psychiatrists are a bit jaded that despite all the efforts to try and get services in the community that target uh, assistance for individuals through the court are not available. So that's one. Second thing is that the psychiatrists themselves are under a lot of pressure. 
the average number of psychiatrists per 100,000 of people in Canada is 13.2 as of 2018. In Saskatchewan, we're operating with half of that psychiatry requirement. So we are 7.4 per 100,000 individuals in the community. What does that mean? They have long waiting lists. They're anxious to take on any new patients, especially those that will delay because once they're in the mental health court, there will be extra services that the psychiatrists will provide beyond just an assessment. So that's one issue. What can we do about it? I think this opportunity to discuss the workings of the mental health court and other collaborations that are possible are very, very positive. As Glenn indicated, the grassroots process started by breakfast meetings. And so if we're having this conversation between the mental health and the legal professional, I think we'll begin to find solutions like the the mental health court, including how do we get uh, psychiatrists to actually take on more patients. Second thing is that we've uh, invited the uh, judges sitting in the mental health court to speak to the psychiatrists, and every time they do that, there's a jump in the enthusiasm of the psychiatrists to be involved. So I think without asking for permission, <laughs> I've committed <laughs> Judge Penner to a grand round presentation in our department <laughs> so we can get a lot of psychiatrists to be interested. The other thing that will be helpful is part of the advocacy that I'm talking about. If we want a seamless and effective service, not only would we have a mental health court that identifies those who need an assessment, but the treatment plan needs to include community services, and I think that helps a lot of the psychiatrists. The one thing that I thought of, which is a bit of a funny thing, is that I r looked at the increases in psychiatrists over the years, and interestingly, there are more females going into psychiatry, so I think we need to do a very positive recruitment of female psychiatrists because they will stay longer and actually traditionally they never get assaulted by offenders, so that would be a good thing for us to do. Right. Um, I have a question that maybe relates to something that, that Judge Penner said earlier about, she gave an example of, of, a, of a, an accused person who had trouble going to the doctor's appointment because of the anxiety and you know, it took multiple times of setting up that appointment to, to even make that, that, uh, that appointment. We know that in court, failure to appear or failure to appear for your court date is a very common occurrence. And maybe, uh, and maybe, I'm, maybe I'm wrong here, but I would assume that that would be uh, an issue also for people with mental or cognitive uh, um, issues, particularly this clientele that's coming before the court. Um, are there ways that that could be managed? Because we do know failures to appear are an expensive are expensive for court systems and maybe lead to additional charges um, because of the failure to appear. Are there better ways to deal with that or strategies that we could be using for, for these uh, individuals? I believe they are. Uh, one of the things that would be very helpful, uh, and I know that I've worked a lot with uh, community corrections, community mental health services, who, by the way, the patients that end up in the mental health courts work with these uh, professionals in the community. It's always helpful to really understand why is the offender failing to attend. That is like the foundational issue. Once you misinterpret that, then every other thing that follows is going to be the wrong plan. As the example Judge Penner gave, without knowing that this individual has anxiety, he will be breached many times and be punished inappropriately. Recognizing that the functions of the brain are important in carrying out the action of completing an instruction means that if there is abnormality in the functions of the brain, it is not too much of a stretch to expect the individual not to be able to meet up the demands of supervision. How does this happen? For an individual to actually carry out 
uh, instruction of the court, they require all their capabilities of listening to the instruction being told to them, focusing on the instruction, not being distracted. If you think about how the court's room is and you're telling the person there are conditions to follow or in an office of a community supervisor when they get easily distracted, being able to recall that information subsequently. So if you have any memory problems, whether it's caused by your medication or caused by the genuine problem that you have, or the person has anxiety, as we heard. I have two examples that I can give you quickly. I had a patient of mine who, for whatever reason, was walking into courts to go and pay a fine, and before then, I'd had a history of having some difficulties in our past, but was tackled over th there in front of the court by officers, and she became exceptionally traumatized by that event and would not drive past 19th Street. Now, if she has any courts to go in, first and foremost, she's scared to tell anybody the reason why she's not going, and she cannot drive to come to the 19th Street and was always being breached until we discovered that she was avoiding that because of the memories that that trauma had brought on her. Similarly, if you have someone who has obsessive compulsive disorder because of the fear of germs, and when they sit in your office as a community supervisor, they don't want to put their hand on anything or collect your pen and sign with it without treatment, you may not be able to know why the person is avoiding your office until you have an assessment. So there are many reasons that our patients actually go through. The one that is quite disturbing are those who have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Because when they speak to you, they speak fluently, they actually use grammar that is sometimes at university level. But when you talk to them and you ask them to explain what you just said to them, they are unable to comprehend. And the brain focuses, I mean, processes those two things differently. One part of the brain deals with comprehension, another part deals with spoken speech. So they do not have to match each other, you can have a discrepancy. So unless you know that difficulty, what can we do about it? I think there are many <coughs> things that the system needs to do about it. One is that when you're talking to an individual with mental illness, recognize what the deficits are help the individual by making the environment quite conducive for learning, take breaks during the conversation with the individual, learn the way they learn best. Some people learn by hearing. I can tell that 100% or maybe 95% of the room is learning by hearing but because some are writing notes. Uh, you need to know how that individual learns. Some people learn by visual so you have to give them preferably icons that suggest what the conditions are rather than expect them to understand it. The other thing is that the system and the people who deal with them need to adopt a perspective of problem solving rather than consequences. So if they fail, let's find out what is the problem that led to that failure and let's resolve the problem rather than punish them for it. I have a saying that says always think ill before evil. So it's really important to think, is it a, an illness that is making this person not to attend their appointment before you can actually go into that? The last thing I would suggest, and I know there are a number of community workers that I've worked with, uh, learn from your colleagues who have been successful. There are a couple of community supervisors that don't see participants in their office. They meet in Tim Hortons or maybe Chinese buffet or something where if you offer your client to meet you in Chinese buffet, they will find a way because you're going to hopefully buy food for them or something. So I think there are many things that we can do, humanly speaking. There are things we can do in the system. There's ways to find out what the exact problems are because, as Heather said, these offenses are expensive and they occur frequently and sometimes it's important to be able to make a stop on it so that we can help these individuals appropriately.